this will take us a while. Now, if you want, if you want the speedy version, go get a Reader's Digest Bible. It'll take most of it out. Or any book written by, any book on Revelation written by an amillennial. And I'll explain the difference uh, here as we get into it. In fact, I'll do it now. There's, I, I took a course on the book of Revelation when I was in Bible college. Got a D minus. So... Does that qualify me to stand here and teach before you today? Well, I've studied more since then, I'll say that. Yeah, and um, it was taught by an amillennial. And let me explain the difference. Millennial means the 1,000 years, okay? So it has to do with how, it, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with what the book of Revelation says. But it has everything to do with how someone what someone tries to make it say, all right? So I believe that John wrote very plainly, which means that I take a literal interpretation of it. If John said it, he saw it, and he wrote down what he saw, okay? Now... I remember reading the book, Late Great Planet Earth, by Hal Lindsey. Hal Lindsey was trying to describe Revelation 9, these locusts that came up out of the pit. And he visualized that John didn't know what he was looking at. He was looking at Apache attack helicopters. And he, because he had, he didn't, he had never seen one. So he's going, looks like the face of a man and the, and the, the chopper was the hair of a woman, you know, because I guess women go around like this with their hair all the time. That's what he said. Yeah, like that. Do that again. Like that. See, that makes me dizzy. I could only do it once. So anyway, that's what that's was Hal Lindsey's big. I mean, he sold millions of copies of this book, launched his career. And it was all, he made it up. He made up this interpretation of Revelation 9 and these, and these locusts that came up out of the pit. So, um, but it has to do with your view of the millennium. <clears throat> and the term amillennial means, literally means no millennium. It's not that they don't believe that Christ reigns, it's they don't believe that he's coming to literally sit on the earth in public view of everybody for exactly 1,000 years. Because they have this really smart, we're scholars, so we know more than everybody else does. And I can remember my professor, who, by the way, is still teaching there at that college, found out. He, ex he expressed it like this, the book of Revelation falls into a group of Greek literature called apocalyptic literature, explaining that there were other writers around the time of John that were writing about, you know, how they didn't like the Roman government. They didn't like Caesar. Or they were talking about the end of the world, okay? And it was all symbolic language and that was never meant to be taken literally. The symbolism, um, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't apply it literally. It, it was symbolic because they didn't want the Roman government finding out what they were writing about, what, what their real secret was. So when John is describing a beast in Revelation 13, he's really talking about the emperor of Rome, and he, but he doesn't want the emperor of Rome to find out that he's talking about, you know, he's talking about him, so he calls him a beast, because the idea is that John is afraid that he'll be killed by the Roman government. Now, by this time, John is around 95 years old. When you're 95 years old, do you care if you get arrested? Do you care if they're going to come and kill you? You're like, what do I have to do to die out of this body? 
So, th but that was the explanation of it. That revelation fit into an earthly group of literature that was written by other people at that time, so therefore it couldn't be seen as literal. Here's the problem with that. You can't compare what John or Paul or Peter wrote with any other book anywhere else in the entire world because it didn't come from anywhere in this world. It came down from heaven. John wasn't fr afraid one bit of, if he was going to write about Rome, he would have wrote about Rome. If, if, if John was afraid of the emperor of Rome, or he wasn't. So they, they, they say that the thousand years is not to be taken literal, it is symbolic, and they explain it like this. Back in those days, a thousand was a big number. Okay? So when you said like, that, wow, that must have cost a thousand drachmas or whatever. Well, that was like saying, wow, that must have cost a billion dollars. In other words, it was a, a, an a expression of speech that doesn't really mean what what they're saying but again God is the one who sends these words down Jesus is the one giving these things to John telling him write these words down so it wasn't a an expression or a manner of speech or anything like that he said a thousand years so any place else in the Bible when Jesus said that he would rise on the third day what happened rose on the third day when Naaman is told to dip in the River Jordan seven times, how many times? God tells Israel to march around Jericho. I catch people with that every time. Thirteen times. One time a day, everybody goes, oh, yeah. One time a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day. Okay, thirteen times. I remember my second grade math. So that, that's exactly what they did. One time a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day. That's exactly what they did. So in every other place in the Bible, the number is literal. When, God, when Daniel was looking in Jeremiah to see how long they would be in Babylonian captivity, he found comfort in the fact that God said he was going to be there 70 years. How long were they there? 70 years exactly 70 years and then God brought them all back Daniel said I found comfort in that I read it in the book I believe it okay so if God said 70 years to Jeremiah and they were in captivity 70 years then if God says that Jesus is literally going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem and reign for 1,000 years and that we're going to reign with him that is exactly what I believe but that's what it has to do with this amillennial the phrase amillennialism basically says that all of Revelation is symbolic. It doesn't literally mean what it says. There is postmillennialism, which says that, and this was popular before World War II, but has regained popularity through the, what's called the Kingdom Now movement. There's a lot of Latter-day Apostolic, the Apostolic Reformation, the Latter-day Reign people, the Joel's Army people. A lot of the, 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 the Bethel Church in Redding, California would believe this doctrine. They believe that we are going to take over the entire world with Christianity. We're going to bring down all of the evil governments, we're going to destroy all of the evil empires. God's going to make us to where nothing can kill us. And we're going to basically just take over the world so that Jesus can come and we'll hand him all the kingdoms of the earth. That's post-millennialism. I don't buy it for a second. Okay? And it's not true. Premillennialism is what I still am. I believe that there are events that are going to take place, including the translation, the rapture, the beast will rise, 
the vials of wrath will be poured out. Then, Revelation 19, Jesus comes down on his white horse. The uh, armies of the saints coming with him. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, all riding on white horses. I believe that's us who have been translated, redeemed in our new bodies. And we will come down. We will literally reign with Jesus Christ for precisely 1,000 year period. Okay, that's what premillennialism is. Now, I don't really care much for titles, so I just don't take them. If you ask me, do I believe in a literal 1,000 year reign? Gotcha. That's what it says, and that's what I believe. All right. So anyway, all of that aside, I won't get into the pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib stuff, because I walked away from that years ago too. So let's take the book of Revelation the way we take any other book in the Bible. If it says it, then we believe it. We believe exactly what it says because Jesus told John, write down everything that I tell you and then everything that you see because these things are going to happen. Okay, so the beast, he's got seven heads. That's going to look funny. It's going to look weird. But he has seven heads. He has ten horns. Are they symbolic? Yes. There's symbolisms attached to them. The number ten. Why are they horns? Why are they heads? There is symbolisms. But those symbolisms are always going to be defined by the Bible. Not by Hal Lindsey or a commentary or, any, or Mike Hoggard or anybody else. They'll be defined by scripture. So that's the approach that we're going to take. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the key to the entire book. The, the entire Bible. And the, the entire book of Revelation. The key to it is, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. I'll go into the scriptures of that a little bit. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signify it by his angel unto his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God. If you underline things in your Bible, underline the phrase bear record. That seems to be a favorite expression of John. Bear record or bear witness. You'll see it in the gospel. I, John, bear record of these things. 1 John 5, 7, the missing verse out of all the new Bibles. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And then he says there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, the blood, and these, three, and these three agree in one. So that phrase, bear record or bear witness, it kind of shows you, because every writer in the Bible has their own style, and that was John's sort of his signature. That's what set him apart from the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You won't see that in their gospels, but you'll see it in John, you'll see it in the letters of John, and you see it here in the book of Revelation. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. There you are right on time. It's exactly the way you said you were going to be. Halfway through Sunday school. And of all things that he saw, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. And believe it or not, some churches won't touch the book of Revelation. And it says right here that there's a blessing to those who read it. And those who believe it. Those who hear the words of this prophecy. There is a blessing in reading about, I mean, because think about it. Genesis tells the story of the beginning of the creation... Revelation tells a better story of a new creation where we have new bodies, where we live in a better world, where cops don't get killed, where children don't die, where suffering doesn't take place, where tears don't run down our eyes. Yes. Yeah. They make it hard because of these 
these names I was telling you, these titles, are you pre-trib, are you mid-trib, are you post-trib, are you post-millennial, are you amillennial, are you pre-millennial? Okay, but that's, that's what men do. Men make it difficult. God makes it simple. Just believe it. Now, one thing I will say, I guarantee you in the course of this study, I'm going to be wrong about several things. Guarantee you. If I knew what I was going to be wrong about, I would change it and correct myself or let God correct me. We don't, none of us can see the future. None of us can. None of us can see the future the way God sees it. None of us, I mean, even though I believe every one of these words, when I draw the picture in my mind of how it looks, I may be wrong. So, to those of you, I've been kind of criticized last week or so um, by some people that didn't like that I wouldn't agree with them on certain things related to things that are going to happen in the future. We all see through a glass darkly. Very important to remember. Don't ask me to be perfect in anything, especially looking into the future, because I guarantee you I'll get it wrong every single time. Let God be true, every man a liar. Okay? So you read this yourself and let God take you where he wants you, okay? But I guarantee you, in this study, I'm going to be wrong. All right, maybe that is why I got a D minus. Anyway, who bear record of the word of God, of the testimony of Jesus, and of all the things that he saw, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand, that could mean it's within reach, could be, could be a number, the number 25, or the number 5, the number 27, there's 27 bones in my hand, That's, this is the 27th book of the New Testament, could mean a lot of things, but anyway, blessed are they who read, blessed are they who hear, blessed are they who keep these things, keep them, hold on to this, don't let anybody else tell you an alternative future. Don't believe the internet people who are saying they're having dreams and visions all the time about what's going to happen. Don't believe, these, don't believe these people who had a dream about Donald Trump. Don't believe these people, and I don't care if it, if it says he's going to be the next president. Don't believe these people who come up with different prophecies. If they're not in here, don't believe them. Believe this. Hold on to this. Amen? Because I've, listen, I've been studying prophecy all my life. All my life. Um, I'm having a hard time grasping words this morning, but I've been doing it seriously since 1998. And since 1998, I've seen a lot of crackers come and go. Crazy guys, crazy women who make up stuff, make up prophecies, make up dates for the rapture, and they've all been wrong, every one of them. And do they ever apologize? No. Do they ever retract their statement? No. They just say, God changed his mind. Yeah. So when it comes to what's on the internet, You've got a choice to make. You either believe what's on the internet or believe what's in this book. And there's a blessing if you will hold on to what's in this book. Amen? That's what that means. Uh, Galatians 1. The phrase, Revelation, that phrase, Revelation of Jesus Christ, is actually in several other places in the Bible. Here's what Paul said. Paul, remember, Paul used to be Saul, and when he was Saul, he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. He didn't believe it. How did Saul go from Saul to Paul? How did he go from not believing it to believing it? 
It was revealed to him. And who revealed it to him? Jesus himself showed up on Paul's road to Damascus and said, Paul, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul had, wasn't going after Jesus, or so he thought. But every time he had one of those Christians arrested, he was persecuting Christ himself. Remember, we're part of his body. Jesus takes it personally. So Paul said, for I neither received it of man, nor was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I would say the same thing. The things that I learned, the things that I didn't learn in a semester class, because that's all it was, one semester, the book of Revelation, D minus, the things that I didn't learn in that class, I've learned since then. And I've got some views and opinions and things that I strongly believe in in the book of Revelation. Revelation 9, that those beasts that come up out of the pit, those are not a helicopters. They're devils. Okay, that's the plain, simple reading of it. That's what you get out of it. And I didn't understand that back in, what was that, 1985? I didn't get that. Now I get it. Okay? And how do I get it? By the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will teach you things. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. So that's how Paul got it. First Peter chapter 1. Peter had his problems. Remember, he's the one that betrayed Christ. But he said, Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. So think about how Peter is using this phrase. He's using this phrase as if it was a particular event. And it will be. Because we know that when Jesus appears in the air, who's going to see it? everybody the whole world and and that's explained it later on in this chapter and they that pierced him everybody is going to see jesus when he appears in the air and he ca catches us up into heaven so there's coming a day when jesus is going to be revealed to the entire world now for us we're going to go, yippee! And for the rest of the world, they're going to go, uh-oh. Because it's going to be too late for them. Think of the day, think of the day before it started raining in the days of Noah. And all of Noah's family, his neighbors, making fun of him sitting inside that ark. And they're not buying what he's telling them. God's going to destroy this earth. Once you come in, they're not believing it. All of a sudden the door shuts and it starts raining. Do they believe then? Yep. They believe it. Think of Rahab the harlot. Did she believe that God was going to destroy Jericho before it happened? She believed it. But it was known by the, the king of Jericho that the Israelites were coming and it was known that the two spies were there inside the city because they went looking for them and then she hit them out. Did they believe it? Not necessarily. But did it happen? Yes. But by the time they sounded the what? What did they sound? Jericho. Remember that story? What did they sound? The trumpets. That's a clue. By the time they sounded the trumpets, it was too late for everybody in Jericho. Okay? And when you look at the book of Revelation, we have a series of seven trumpets that are blown. And by the time you get to that last trump, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I just quoted the last trump. Then the last trump, seven angels comes out with seven vials of wrath.
to pour out. By the time the vials of wrath are poured out, it is too late for everybody else. Amen? For God has not appointed us unto wrath. So that's what I believe. If you want to get to it, that's what I believe. But Peter talks about a day that's coming. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought. Do, do we not have grace now? Yes. But are we going to receive the greatest grace that anybody can ever receive on the day that Jesus is revealed in heaven? Yeah. The greatest grace in the world is coming. And we'll be glad for that day. Amen? Don't, don't be afraid of it. Look forward to it, because that's coming. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according, and this doesn't say the revelation of Jesus Christ, but it says the revelation of the mystery. And what was the mystery? Well, part of it, as far as Paul was concerned, part of it was, who is the Messiah? Who is God? Who is the real God? The real God is Jesus Christ. So he says, uh, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. If you keep reading, it says, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets. Then Ephesians 3, Paul explains this further. He said in verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a four in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, is Christ a mystery to us? No, we know who he is. And even though we've never seen him, when we see him, we will know him because we shall be like him. We're going to be changed instantly by the grace of God. That's what that's referring to. But the rest of the world, you go out here and talk to 20 people out on the street, get 20 different opinions about who Jesus was. And I don't like C.S. Lewis, but there's one thing that he said that I thought was pretty good. He said either Jesus was God or he was a really bad man. And he explained it like this. You ask people, what do you think about Jesus? Well, he was a good man. Okay. What do you think about his teachings? Well, they were good teachings. Was he God? No, he wasn't God. But Jesus himself taught that he was God. So both can't be true. If you say he's a good man and his teachings were good, and yet you don't believe that he was God, the savior of mankind, that makes Jesus the worst person to ever show up in the world because he's defrauded how many millions of people throughout the last 2,000 years? That makes him a very bad man. So you can't say he was a good man, but he wasn't God because those two ideas are contradictory. If he's not God and he said he was before Abraham was, I am. He claimed that title. So the world out here, they don't know who Jesus is the way we know him. So it's our responsibility to try to reach them, to try to tell them, to try to give them the knowledge of Christ, to try to teach them that he's the Savior, that he died for them, rose again, when he's, and he's coming back, and he's going to take all of those that he saved with him, and the rest are going to suffer the wrath of God it's important that they learn it now because when he's revealed to the world, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. Uh, now, verse 4. That wasn't too bad. I got through three verses. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Okay? Grace be unto you. And the question is, what are these seven churches? What are these seven churches? Uh, let's read it. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, 
Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits, we're going to touch on that, which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and of the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So that's verses four and five. So who or what are these seven churches? Well, we'll make it simple. The, uh, where does it give the list here? What verse? Um, uh, verse 11. If you look at verse 11, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna. Or we had a pastor here from North Carolina years ago. Smyrna, that's what he said. Smyrna, I'll never forget that. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Now, some say that the seven churches are the seven different uh, ages or seven different eras of time in the church age. From the time of Pentecost until the rapture, that these seven churches represent seven, I guess, seven dispensations of church ages ending with the Laodicean church of the last days and the Laodicean church is bad and it's awful and it's terrible and they're not really right with God. Okay? Um, do I believe that? Not really. Is it possible? Maybe. Okay? But two things to me are very clear. Number one, we know that at the time John wrote this, there were seven churches in these exact cities that Jesus sent these letters to. Okay? But guess what? None of them exist today. They're not there. Okay? In fact, most of this is in the area of well, Turkey, Greece, over in that part of the world. And that part of the world, predominantly, what are they? They're either Muslim or Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. And 20 billion years removed away from the gospel, no matter how you, no matter how you look at it. Okay? There is some Christianity in that area. But it ain't much. But definitely, these churches that he wrote these letters to, they simply don't exist in the same form as they did 2,000 years ago. Okay? So, does that mean that what is written to these seven churches is only applied and can only be applied to these seven churches alone. Well, let's look at Romans. Very quickly, who did Paul write the book of Romans to? The Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, and he says in verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Now, if we take the idea that what Jesus had written to the seven churches is only to those seven churches. Where does that leave us when we're trying to give somebody what we call the Romans road of salvation? Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10. Where does that leave us? If Romans is only written to the Roman church and nobody else, how are we going to teach somebody about for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. For the uh, wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal. How are we going to teach them about the gospel and about how to be saved? If it's all to them. Same thing in Corinthians. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ unto the church of God which is at Corinth. Galatians. Paul an apostle under the churches of Galatia. Ephesians. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus. Philippians, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. If we were to apply the rule 
that what Jesus said to those seven churches should only be applied to those seven churches, then we'd have to apply it to Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, all the other letters that Paul wrote. He, didn't, he wrote the book of Philemon not to a city or a church, but to an individual. And yet, is it not doctrine that is for us? Yes, absolutely. So again, the simplest way to look at this is in each of those seven churches, there's doctrine there for all of us throughout all of the church's history, those seven letters came from the head down to the body. And when you read about the Laodicean church, are there warnings that everybody today should take heed of? What was the biggest warning? Jesus said, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to take your candlestick out. Whew. Ask yourself now, are there churches that years ago used to preach the straight and true way and yet now are so far removed? I, I, I know the bell rang, but I had a conversation with an old friend the other day. And he said that he doesn't, they have a praise band at his church. He said, I don't even know their names. And he said, our church hired them. They're a professional band. Our church hired them. And he said, when they get done singing on the stage and they walk out, they get in their cars and go home. They don't even sit in a church service. He said, these are not even Christian people as far as I could tell because they don't sit next to us in the church service. And I've seen that with my own eyes. I visited a church one time in Branson and during the preaching, I had to take Caleb out to the bathroom and I walk out and there's the praise band sitting out in the hallway talking. And I'm going, shouldn't they be in here? I mean, I make my sister sit in here. Right? But he said, they're hired to come in and play the drums and sing good, all that good music. And he said, they get in their car and leave. You think God's in that? Laodicea. There's an example. Amen.